Welcome to another episode of GUI Challenges, where I build interfaces my way, and then I challenge you to do it your way. Because with our creative minds combined, we're going to find multiple ways to solve these interfaces and expand the diversity of our skills. And in today's GUI Challenge, we're building a card stack. How would you do this stack? How would you make it do these animations? Do you see a little bit of what we're going to be doing today? We're animating Transform Origin and making some pretty sweet effects. All right, so for a quick overview of what's going on, we've got a group of cards, and they're all in one little area. They're piling on top of each other, and that's being done with grid. And then you can see I have a hover effect on here too, so when I hover, they protrude up, and notice that they're not just moving physically up, they're, they're shooting up from where their transform origin is, and that's critical. We're gonna, we're gonna kinda go over where I was originally using individual transforms, but I couldn't get this effect with them, and so we'll debug that. But OK, so we have a stack with grid. All of the interactions with this form over here on the left in these field sets is using has. So when one of these is checked, I go and update the position of all these to this transform origin and watch them all sort of animate. They each have their own little bit of rotation. So here, if I go back to the center, we have some that are rotating counterclockwise and some that are rotating clockwise. And they're all rotating based off of what I'm calling here like a a scalar or, or or some there's a multiplication happening. So here's multiplied by zero, here's multiplied by one, and then as we continue adding this scalar effect, we can see them fan out in different directions. And that's just kind of cool on itself. I kind of like that reveal. It just looks really nice. Um, anyway, that's what's happening here. And so the scalar is just essentially setting, I mean, I call it a gap, but it's kind of because it kind of looks like a gap. That's affecting the rotation on these particular elements. OK, so we have has that's looking at the values of these forms and assigning some kind of states for these transitions. We have grid, which is doing the overarching uh, kind of grid here. And then we have some transforms using custom properties. We're going to go over all that today, as well as dive into some of the bugs. And let's, uh, of course, go check it out in the debugging corner first, because there's kind of a surprise over there that um, I want to share with you. So let's go check that out. Here's the debugging corner. We've light things on top and iOS, which I think just looks kind of nice. Let's let's pick some cool values for this uh, here. How about that one? Yeah, that looks nice. It looks like a little fan, like a keychain fan of cards. That's cool. Pick this one as bottom center. Uh, sure. I mean, even though I prefer this kind of center where it's got a really far out um, value, we'll talk about that here. Here it is working on iOS. Cool. Um, here, let's just bump up that gap. Yeah, that's fun. Bottom left, sure. Bump up the gap. Everything's looking good in here. So has is working across all these different platforms. Now over here, we have Firefox looking like it supports has. So here, I'll just uh, change a value. Oh, but it didn't change. Well, look, if I reload the page, then it picks it up. So there's an experimental implementation of has in Firefox. It's just sort of not live like if the values change after page loads they don't, they don't update so here i can reload the page and see the effects of has but it's not as interactive uh, which is fine and then this one's powered by javascript and it's just kind of writing values and so you can see that's working great but interesting right so firefox has an experimental i went to about config proceeded with caution i searched has and in here i saw look at this layout css has selector enabled i enabled that and that's what gave me this feature here where I can reload where I can reload it and see it in action. So anyway, once has is available on Firefox stable, this demo will work flawlessly. But for now, it's a little clunky in Firefox, but that's OK. The interaction model here with using has was just kind of fun. Uh, you could easily write some JavaScript and make this cross browser. But I just thought it was fun to use. I like has. I want to use has. So anyway, that was the feature. Here it is working across all the browsers. Looks sweet. Now let's go dive in and inspect how this was all accomplished over in Chrome. All right, it is time to dig into the grid layout, the transforms, and the use of has that is powering this thing. So I'm going to hit Command Option I to bring up a dev tools. And let's look at this first grid on the body. So we have two equal columns created by grid template columns, repeat to 1FR. It also has place items center, which is the same thing as align items center and justify items center. And we can see that being effective here. Well, let's drop this gap down. 
Oh yeah, zero is fine, just so we can see the layout. These items are vertically and horizontally centered, right? So we've aligned them into the center and then we've justified them into the center. Over here, we've aligned them in center, but hey, how come the justification isn't there? Well, if we go look at the card stack, it's said to justify itself to start. And the reason I did that was, well, here, if we fan these back out again, and if we don't do this, see how they're like immediately off screen? We can go off screen really easy. It's like seeing the like top right, or if we fan these out more, just kind of, ah, it, I didn't think that looked as good as if we tuck it in a little bit. And now we get to see more of these items and it just ultimately feels a little bit more attached to our content here. So that was cool. We also have a form here with a grid. So let's turn on this grid and check out the styles here. We have display grid with a gap, right? Here's our gap and we have justify items start. Now this is something I really like to add to grid and flex layouts so that each item can have its own width. So if we turn this off, see how this section and this section were stretched to fit? It also kind of oddly changed the size of these elements. But if I said justify items to start, then their own sizing, the, the length of this label is determining the width of this field set. Same thing here with this, this slider is determining the width of this um, gap field set. And I just think that looks really nice. And so we have justify items start there for that. Let's look inside of here, each of these field sets, these field sets have a cool trick. So it's just set to display grid with a gap. Notice there's no template. Yet if we look at the label here, cause look, we have a we have like two columns, but these are all just a bunch of items in here. So if I take out grid column two, this is what that grid layout does by default to this just stack of content. But by setting the grid column to two, on the label, I'm essentially telling this parent grid, I need a column, uh, it, it, I need a second column. And it goes, okay, well, here's a second column and it puts all the labels inside of there. And then it looks at all the inputs and go, well, you haven't been assigned anything. So you're just gonna go into column one. We'll auto place you into column one. Every label will be placed in column two. And we get this really nice layout. And that was all it took was just assigning that label into the second one, which comes in especially nice here, because if we look down here at this item, it doesn't have a label. It's just got the legend here as part of the field set. And if we were to, so here, if I take out grid column two, if I was to go into the parent layout here for field set and create some grid template columns, grid template columns and say like uh, auto one FR, which should give us a pretty similar result. See how we get a very, very similar result. We have an auto. So the first column is being set by the contents. They're all the same. So it's just this small fit. And then this next one is going to be one FR. It's consuming the rest of the space. And then these items are all going to get to set uh, to that length. But look down here. It created a second column, even though there's nothing to go inside of it. And that's because we defined grid template columns. We said there's two columns, but that's just not the case all the time. So by switching back to this one where there's a dynamic set of columns created just for these labels, this particular case down here doesn't get an extra column made. So kind of a cool little trick there to use with um, grid. Um, all right, so let's go on to our card stack and check this one out. If I hit grid, we'll get our, <gasps> what is this? Look at this, we got a cool little labeled um, layout that says GUI challenges. Oh, it's a little Easter egg I put in there for everybody. You're probably a little tired of hearing me talk about this stack layout um, that I do with grid all the time because I, I'm i avoiding positioning elements absolutely, but I am getting them all to fill the same space. Here, let's take out the gap, let them all sit on the same spot and check out how this was accomplished. So I have display grid, of course, we have grid. This is the template being defined for rows and columns at the same time the rows the first start of the row the like line name here you could see it right here this row is called gui and it's taking up one fr so it's just going to kind of fit and fill the space that's being given then we have a slash because we're going to define our columns and this column name is going to be started as challenges and its size is min 50 v min or 40 characters so we're kind of saying um don't go bigger than 40 characters but allow yourself to be flexible at half of the viewport space and if i drop this down we can see that this column is defining the size of this column. And then these cards, each of these cards has an aspect ratio set. Where's the aspect ratio? Right here to ratio portrait, which is the same thing as, ah, uh, look, if I hover, you can see it there, three by four, three by four. And that's why these elements are consuming and being that large is they're filling the column that they're given and they're of an aspect ratio. So both of those things combined make them fit into the allocated grid space that they're being given and maintaining a ratio of a card shape. So kind of cool. Come back to this card parent layout. And um, again, just remember that these are one row, one column, one row, one column. And then each of these is being assigned 
the grid area of GUI challenges. So it's saying you should be on the row that starts with the name GUI and you should be in the column that starts with the name challenges. And sure enough, that puts them all in the same row and the same column, all in the same single cell, and they stack on top of each other very naturally. And at this point, we can begin doing our transforms that start to rotate them out in different directions. It's worth noting here that some go counterclockwise and some go clockwise, and we'll go look at how that's calculated here in just a second. Cool, so that is the grid layout for that, and that kind of concludes all of the different grids. Although one of the things I really liked about this was like if you set this up and you go into the layout here and you kind of extend the grid lines, you can start to see some really healthy relationships that happen between your alignment. Um, and I also think it just looks neat. Plus, you can change these colors and pick something way rather. Like here, let's go like hot pink. And this one will do like a super vibrant lime green. Yeah, look at that. Now it's on theme. Wait, our, this one is yellow. Here, yeah, let's change this one to cyan. Great, right? Now we have like some really neat looking overlays. You can also come in here and easily turn those off. The grid tab tools are really nice. Make sure you have show area names and show line names on if you want to see the line names here. So these are the line names. There's no area names to be shown. And then I've extended the grid lines. So just kind of cool tips and tricks with grid. Grid is super rad. I'm very pumped on it. OK, so let's check out the next part, which is how are all these sort of transforms being applied? So let's inspect a card, not this card, because it's kind of not doing anything interesting. Let's check out this card, this one that's kind of spun out all the way on the left. And we can see our selector for it, right? OK, so we have HTML has hashtag. So it's an ID of an element. This is one of our radio inputs is called mode bottom center. If it's checked, go find the card stack and each card set their transform origin to bottom center. So that's how all of these are being transitioned right now is we're just transitioning one property on every single card called transform origin to the bottom center. Right, so I could pop in here and edit this if I wanted to and be like, top center. Oh, that was kind of cool, just top uh, left. Oh, right. Oh, here, let's increase the gap. Oh, that is cool. So then here, if I come in here and go left. Oh, that is awesome. If I delete it, it just goes somewhere. That's sweet. Top, bottom, center, bottom right. Right, bottom left, top left, <laughs> top right. Okay, okay, you can basically see in here what we're supposed to be bottom center, bottom. So you can see how I came up with, with these different radios and how I was having fun is I initially set this up so the transform origin um, was going to be the thing that kind of pivots all of these. And I just had a bunch of fun and was like, wow, this is this is way more exciting than just a card stack. Animating this card stack using the transform origin is really cool. Um, and that's what I came up with. So here we'll decrease this gap a little bit. Um, these are the built-in transform origins. So if I use the keyboard here, I can kind of just move through here. So we've got bottom center, bottom left, top left, top right, bottom right. And I like how it just sort of shifts amongst all the corners here. It's good stuff. And then since this radio group has the same name as this radio group, even though it's two separate field sets, you can see that they all maintain, um, they can only have one selected. And so it can either be these custom ones, which kind of show how to do um, additional um, kind of perspective origins that extend beyond just inside of the box. So what's nice about these ones is they all stay inside of the box. But I really like how this fans out, which is a lot closer to how it would fan out in your hands because the palm of your hand is essentially the transform origin. You can imagine like the palm of your hand is right here and then you fan them out from there. And it gets a much more natural looking fan out than if you just do bottom center. See how this one you can see here's the perspective origin or the transform origin right here. Whereas this one says it's center horizontally, but 200 off screen outside of the box. And it gives us this really nice arcing effect, um, which is just kind of cool. And then here's some other custom ones to do. So this one is negative 25, negative 25. So it's over here and up here and kind of gives them this nice, as opposed to like top left, which again, they're really tight on the corner, which can be cool. Like if you want this keychain effect, but if you wanted the effect of like in somebody's hand or it, you know, something's holding it up here, you can set that transform origin off into the distance. And that was just a really fun effect. And if you combine that with all the rotations, so let's look at the rotation here. We have R being calculated against our scalars. So this is our scalar here. As this changes, you can see our scalar here being updated. So it's set to 9. There it is at 14. Here it is at 4. Let's set it to 2 so the math is nice and easy for us to do in our minds. Go back to a card, and we'll look at what's happening here. So this first card is being 
uh, set to the scalar times uh, or five. So five is the default, but right now scalar is two. So two times two is four times one degree is gonna be four degrees times negative one is gonna put it negative four degrees. So let's check out this one. This is the same one, but look, it's not multiplied by negative one. So we still have the scalar times two. So this is four degrees. So this first one is negative four degrees. This one is four degrees. This one is going to be uh, it's going to be taking the scalar and doing a little bit more math. So it kind of pushes it a little bit further out, a little bit further out, and et cetera, right? So these ones did times two. Oh, these ones actually don't go as far. See, they're not times two. So they're just going to go out exactly as the scalar is. So four degrees, uh, and these ones were going to be, well, I guess they're two degrees, and those ones were four. Anyway, you can kind of see what's going on and how they're being fanned out is I'm just using a selector here that's looking to see the specific one and I'm fanning them out either negative or positive times two or not times two. So kind of a little tricky, I guess, because it's math. But once the math was done, it was uh, pretty smooth sailing after that. OK, and the next part that we have, so we've, we've talked about transform origin. We've talked about the um, kind of rotation that's being calculated on these. Let's go look at the actual transform style that's being applied here and see um, why I did this also. So we'll check this out. So here's transform. We've got rotate set to the variable r or zero degrees. So if there is no rotation, we've got like a fallback value at zero degrees. Same thing with translate y being set to t which is short for translate and or X or of zero pixels. So if I hover, let's set hover on here, hover, we can see that T is being set to 50. And that's why it's being offset on its translate Y by 50. And what's kind of cool too, so if we take off the hover, we saw earlier that when these are fanned out really heavily, and we'll go to center, that these things are fanning out and they're being transformed on that translate Y in their own angle based on this sort of rotation that's already happened, right? It rotated and then went and translated. Let's again go look at our transform. We rotate and then translate. We will get a different result if we translate and then rotate. It would then move it up and then rotate it to um, match the angle, which is not going to give us the hover effect that we expect here as they're um, angled. So let's go try that out because I've got some um, example code here that does that. Oh, and then this last part here, we're transitioning transform origin over half a second using a squishy ease, and that's why they sort of bounce. See a little bouncy bounce? That's a little um, open props easing value you can go take. It adds a little kind of squish to things. So it does like a little bit of a bounce um, in, and then it does a bounce out. So it has bounces on both sides, which is fun. And then we do the transform. So like when I hover, uh, that's just using an ease in out. So nothing kind of bouncy in that gesture. But OK, so let's turn off our transition. Let's go back to this transition, which is going to transition the transform origin, translate, and rotate. So we're actually going to go change the way that we're doing these, and we're going to rotate instead. So here we'll take this value r. I think we can just do like rotate var r here. Yes. We might have to do that for each of these. So, yep. So I'll take this one. I'll just pop this. To each of these. So now we're using individual transforms. Oh, this is just fun to do right now. Anyway, look at that. Just watch them all pop into their space. OK, so now they're using individual transforms to rotate. And we're going to use individual transforms to do the hover effect, right? So we translate, and it goes on x by 50. So now I, could, I should be able to have all the same working demos. Yep, all the demos work great. We can see them move amongst all those different positions. But when I hover, look. They just go up. They're like literally moving up. And that's not the effect we want. What's going on here is essentially using the shorthands, like the, these new individual transforms of rotate, you know, some value, and translate two values. By using those, you aren't in control of the order. It's going to translate first and then rotate. That's part of the value of these is they allow you to sort of more succinctly access these transform points, but you aren't in control of the order anymore. And that might not matter in a lot of cases, but look, it totally mattered for what I was building. I needed these to hover and kind of shoot out from where they were already rotated. And so that meant I needed to not use individual transforms. Instead, I needed to manage these by hand. Oh, look, I'm going to go through all these again. That's cool. Here we go. Undo. Undo. I think I missed one. Nope, I got that one. And then we also need to change the hover so that the hover no longer uses the uh, translate property, but sets our custom property. OK, so now we've got our custom properties all set again. Um, we need to update the transform 
back to the one that uses our custom properties, take off the transition that was using the individual transform properties and go back to the one that's transforming transform origin and transform itself. And now as we hover, well, let's take off this hover. Now as we hover, you can see them protruding from their actual rotation. It's really easy to hear or see here in the centered one as they sort of, look at that one, it kind of almost looks like it arcs out, but it's totally just sliding this way. Whereas this one's gonna slide this way. So we can tell that the rotation happened first and then the translate. So kind of a cool little niche moment where individual transforms, I wanted to use them, they're super new, they're really fun, um, but they were ineffective because I needed to manage the order here. So again, I wanted to rotate first, then translate. Here, let's just do this. Let's take this rotation, since now I'm managing transform and do it afterwards and hover. Look, they just move up. It's totally lame. All right, let's go back to the better model. Boop, boop, boop. Drop that, come over here. Yes, hit enter. Ah, it's restored. Okay, so cool. So the last thing we have to cover is the use of has. So when I select one of these over here, they're essentially setting the checked attribute on this particular bottom center one. And so here I'll look at this element here. I'll look at the selector. It says HTML has mode bottom center checked. Then go find the card stack and find each card and set their transition origin to bottom. Here, if we set bottom left, we select another one. We can see the dev tools is updated to bottom left. I go to the center one down here. You can see that we've updated to mode better bottom center checked card stack card. So HTML is the subject looking for any descendant named mode better bottom center and to see if it's checked. So it's kind of cool. We're anchoring our state off of the HTML, looking for any descendant. And then from HTML, we're then going to go look for card stacks and cards, given that this is true. So if this is checked, it's going to find all the cards and set this particular value. And we get what we need here. Let's go back to center so that I can drop the gap here and not have something so wild. Excellent. There you go, much tamer, but still looks great. And so that's what's going on with the has usage. So has is just looking to see if one of these is checked and then it's pivoting the whole application state off of that and targeting and setting styles for anything that it wants anywhere on the page. Yes, it is that powerful. Any nested element anywhere on the DOM can be discovered on the HTML and then passed new values down to anyone else in the DOM. It is so cool. So that is it for today's GUI challenge. I hope you liked this. I thought this was a really fun demo. We're just making a card stack, so it's not a component today, but it did build upon some really fun um, like ideas here, which is I don't think people often animate transform origin, and it ends up being a really fun way to manage this stack of cards. I think if you're managing a stack, you should use grid. It makes it really nice for just assigning everything that same cell we get to work within you know, sized items. We're not just positioning absolute something and sort of losing sizing information. We're staying in flow. Like we could put more content underneath here and it knows what to do because these items are still filling up that cell that they were given. This whole layout isn't devoid of sizing information. It's size full. It's rich of information. We saw that has is coming in Firefox soon um, and we got to build something. I don't know, very visually interesting. Plus, you know, it worked in light mode too. We saw it was uh, looked good in Safari in light theme. Let's check out the light theme in here just because it can kind of be nice to see a, a complementary set of, of, of styles here and look at the cards, nice and bright and vibrant. I hope you enjoyed this GUI challenge. I sure had a bunch of fun making it and I really want to see how you would do this. How would you stack your cards together? What sort of animations are you doing to your stack of cards? And let's build stuff together and grow together. I'll see you on the next GUI challenge. Take it easy, y'all. Bye.